Okay, anyway, well, let me let's carry carry on at this point. Uh, so uh, that is what the Buddha says to uh, Molya Paguna, and then that is not enough. Yeah, then he carries on and he kind of really draws out uh, uh, this in quite a bit of detail. So one thing is if someone criticizes those nuns in your presence, uh, but what if they go beyond that? Uh, so even if someone strikes those nuns with fists, stones, rods, and swords in your presence, you should give up any desire and thought of the lay life. If that happens, you should train like this. My mind will be unaffected. I will blurt out no bad words. I will remain full of compassion with a heart of love and no secret hate. That is how you should train. So even if someone strikes and hurts someone who is dear to you, that's, this is getting really hard now, this is getting much more difficult, yeah? You can imagine how hard this might be, but uh, the idea is, again, this uh, kind of, you have this almost like dispassionate attitude towards people and uh, to, to all people around you. You don't have any of these kind of really strong attachments to anyone. Uh, and uh, so you can be cool even if someone strikes uh, the people who are, loved, who are dear to you. Uh, and uh, that doesn't mean that we become passive. This doesn't mean that we don't care. It just means that we understand how the whole world is uh, run by cause and conditions and that anger and ill will is never really the answer to anything. Uh, it's always the wrong, wrong way to go. Uh, and so this is a case, again, where you have compassionate understanding both for the perpetrator and for the victim. Uh, it doesn't mean you don't care about those nuns. Uh, it doesn't mean that you don't intervene if you can. If you can intervene, of course you intervene. You try to stop those people who do these things. But you do it in a way that is uh, with a wholesome mind. You have compassion for both the person who does it and for the victims at the same time. And then you can intervene often in a very effective way as a consequence because you will intervene in a way where everyone feels that you are, again, you're having their best interest at heart. That's kind of the point here. This is getting difficult, and it's getting more difficult even further down in the sutta. This is only the, this is kind of level, kind of the beginner's level still there, and we come to the really advanced level further down there. I don't know if you even want to know the advanced level, if this is the beginner's level, but uh, you have no choice. You're going to get to know the advanced level, whether you want to or not. Uh, so it's uh, coming soon now. So uh, what do you think? Can you do this? <laughs> At least we can have this as an aspiration, right? This is kind of a, that's the nice thing about this. So even if you can't do it, we can kind of aspire a little bit. We can move a little bit in that direction. That is the nice thing here. And so we don't take it too, uh, too strictly uh, straight away here. So let's carry on. So if anyone criticizes you in your presence, uh, you should give up any desires or thoughts of the lay life. If that happens, you should train like this. Ah, what happened? Mm, this. Yeah, so here we are. So if anyone, don't know why that happens, but anyway, what happened? So if anyone criticizes you in your presence, you give up any uh, thought, desires or thoughts of the lay life. If that happens, you should train like this. My mind will be unaffected. I will blurt out no bad words. I will remain full of compassion with a heart of love and no secret hate. That is how you should train. So this uh, now is getting very personal, right? Uh, they are criticizing you to your face. You are bad. You did some terrible things. Uh, don't do ever do that again, you evil person. Uh, if they say that to you, how do you react? Do you think, yeah, you know, I, I love you, so it's okay. I'll give you a hug. Or, <laughs> <laughs> not sure. You may not. <laughs> So the idea, again, is to remember all of these things. You have that cause and conditions, that nothing is really personal in this world. Uh, people do things not because they really want to hurt you, because they don't understand, because they're blind, because of whatever. Uh, and sometimes maybe they do criticize you with a good reason, and maybe then you should listen to them. Uh, so it, it all depends on the situation. Uh, but uh, getting upset and angry is a bad idea. So you have compassion for that person. You have metta for them. Uh, because that is always the right attitude towards anyone, uh, even if they criticize you to your face uh, when it starts to get difficult. Uh. And now comes the really hard one, yeah? So Paguna, even if someone strikes you with fists, stones, rods, and swords, uh, 
You should give up any desire or thoughts of the day life. Uh, if that happens, you should train like this. Uh, my mind will be unaffected. Uh, I will blurt out no bad words. Uh, I will remain full of compassion with a heart of love and no secret hate. Uh, that is how you should train. Uh, so even if someone uh, strikes you with fist stones, rods and swords, uh, yeah, you should give up any thoughts of kind of, of uh, you should still have compassion and um, metta for them. Uh, this is raising the bar really high, isn't it? Uh, are you, are anyone here able to clear that bar? That's kind of, uh, <laughs> it's asking for a lot. Uh, but of course it can be done, and this is the whole point. Uh, and uh, we still haven't reached the kind of the final, ultimate demand of the Buddha, which comes further down. Uh, but we're getting close now. Uh, and this reminds me of a sutta in the, uh, also later on in the Majjhima called the Punovada Sutta, the instruction to Punna. Punna was one of the Buddha's disciples. Uh, and the Punna comes, goes to the Buddha, and it says to the Buddha, I want to go to the Sunaparanta country. Uh, Sunaparanta, Sunaparanta, it means something like the dog paranta, um, the dog border country or something like that. It's kind of a far away country. And it is well known for being really rough and really harsh place. Yeah, with the dog there's much dust and the dogs are fierce or something like that. Uh, so uh, dusty and dogs are fierce. So probably maybe over towards Maharashtra. I don't know if you know India. If you know the Indian uh, Maharashtra is kind of where it gets very dry towards the north, a little bit towards the north um, west of India. I think in towards that direction. Uh. And uh, so he says, I will go there. And the Buddha says to him, are you sure you want to go there? There's so much dust and the dogs are really fierce. Uh, is that a good place to go? Uh, and what, you know, what happens if they abuse you when you go there? Uh, and Buddha says, well, if they abuse me, I will say, well, thank you for not hitting me with fists. <laughs> but what if they hit you with fists? I will say, well, thank you for not hurling stones at me. <laughs> But what if they throw stones at you? I will say, well, thank you for not attacking me with a sword. <laughs> but what if they do attack you with a sword? I will say, well, thank you for not killing me. But what if they kill you? And then he says, well, if, if they kill you, I will say, well, there have been other monks who have been seeking the sword to commit suicide. I didn't even have to seek the sword. <laughs> <laughs> The Buddha says, okay, you are ready. <laughs> you, are, you can deal with the Sunaparanta country. Yeah? You can deal with the fierce dogs and the dust if you can deal with that kind of thing. Yeah? And that is kind of the, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the fearlessness. And this is kind of what happens when you become, go a very long way on this path. Uh, because your life doesn't really mean so much anymore uh, when you become a stream mentor and arahant. Yeah? You have found the liberation from suffering already. Whether you live or not, that's kind of not... That doesn't really matter. Yeah, it's not so important. Okay, it's nice today. We can help others. But if you die, okay, you know, that's, that's not a big deal. Eh? And uh, so this is kind of the right attitude. Then you're ready to be the, uh, the person who goes off to the far dangerous countries, yeah, to the, maybe to Norway to convert the Vikings, yeah, to become Buddhists. Uh, that's how I ended up as a Buddhist, I think. Some Buddhists went there a long time ago, converted some Vikings. That's probably what happened there. And now that's what happened. <laughs> but uh, yes, you become kind of fearless. And this is one of the qualities of the uh, Aryas. They are fearless people uh, because they're not concerned about the things that most people are concerned about. So, yeah, so this is, uh, this is what he replies, uh, or, or what the Buddha says. Uh, and then, the Buddha carries on. Then the Buddha said to the mendicants, Mendicants are used to be satisfied with the mendicants. Once I address them, I eat my food in one sitting per day. Doing so, I find that I'm healthy, well, nimble, strong, and living comfortably. comfortably. You too should eat your food in one sitting per day. Doing so, you will find that you are healthy and well, nimble, strong, and living comfortably. I didn't have to keep on instructing those mendicants. I just had to prompt their mindfulness. So this is what the Buddha, the ideal way, that you just kind of say what is right, and then they just do it. And then he comes up with some similes. Suppose a chariot stood harnessed at 
harness to thoroughbreds at a level crossroads with the goad ready. Then a deft horse trainer, a master charioteer, might mount the chariot, taking the reins in his right hand and the goad in the left. He'd drive out and back wherever he wishes, whenever he wishes. In the same way, I didn't have to keep on instructing those mendicants. I just had to prompt their mindfulness. So, mendicants, you too should give up what's unskillful and devote yourself to the skillful qualities. In this way, you will achieve growth, improvement, and maturity in this teaching and training. Yeah. So, uh, the idea here is that if you take the Buddha as your teacher, uh, then you just follow the instructions. Yeah, You don't really quibble, you don't argue so much, you don't uh, doubt what is being said, you just uh, go for it. That's what it means to uh, have confidence in the Buddha, in a sense. You just follow the training. If the Buddha says, eat one meal a day, you say, yes, sir, and you just eat one meal a day. Yeah. And uh, usually that's plenty enough, actually, for uh, living in a monastery. Yeah. Just as the deaf horse trainer, yeah, all it has to do because the horses are well trained. And then when the horses are well trained, they can drive the chariot in the, in the same way. So in the same way, the monks are well trained because they have that right confidence and faith in the Buddha. You can drive the monks in the right direction, uh, which is the direction of liberation. And then everything goes well as a consequence. Uh, Suppose that not far from a town or village there was a large grove of sal trees that was choked with castor oil weeds. Then along comes a person who wants to help protect and nurture that grove. They cut down the crooked sal saplings that were robbing the sap and they would throw them out. That clean up the interior of the grove and properly care for the straight, well formed sal saplings. In this way, in due course, that sal grove would grow, increase, and mature. In the same way, mendicants, you too should give up what's unskillful and devote yourself to skillful qualities. In this way, you will achieve growth, improve maturity in this teaching and training. So you throw out the castor oil weeds, you throw out the crooked salt saplings. And these are, of course, the unskillful qualities of the mind, like hanging out too much with the nuns. Yeah, bad, it says here. And then, you, uh, uh, then the skillful qualities can grow as a consequence. So you achieve maturity in this teaching and training. That's the Dhamma Vinaya. Dhamma Vinaya is used in the suttas to mean any kind of spiritual path. Yeah, every teacher would have a Dhamma Vinaya. A Dhamma is the teaching. The Vinaya is like the practice that comes from that teaching. It does not mean the Vinaya Pitika or the training rules as such. It just means the general training that arises from the Dhamma. And so this is what comes out of this. Make sense? Once upon a time, so now we come to the stories, a nice little story in this particular sutta, and the story is kind of there to underline the point made by the Buddha. Once upon a time, mendicants, right here in Savati, there was a housewife named Videhika. She had this good reputation. The housewife Videhika is sweet, even-tempered and calm. Now Videhika had a bonded maid, a servant named Kali, who was skilled, skilled, tireless, and well organized in her work. Then Kali thought, my mistress has a good reputation as being sweet, even tempered, and calm. But does she actually have anger in her, or just not show it? Or does she have no anger? Or is it just because of my work is well organized that she doesn't show anger? even though she still has it inside. Why don't I test my mistress? <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> this is very interesting. Yeah. Living dangerously. <laughs> so Kali got up during the day. Yeah, but Videka said to her, What the hell, Kali? <laughs> I think this is not a literal translation, but it is a kind of what they call an inspired translation, I think they call that. 
got up during the day means like late in the day, yeah? She didn't get up in the morning. The, in kind of the ideals of the servant is that the servant is supposed to get up before the mistress and the master of the house and then go to bed after. This is kind of the ideal. So, and maybe that means they get a rest during the day. I'm not sure. But hopefully they do. But that's kind of the ideal in ancient India. I don't know if that's still the case, but... Uh, what is it, madam? You are, we, you are getting up in the day. What's up with you, girl? Nothing, madam. Nothing's up with you, bad girl. But you got up in the day, angry and uh, upset. She scowled. Then, uh, then Kali thought, my mistress actually has anger in her and just doesn't show it. It's not that she has no anger. It's just because my work is well organized that she doesn't show her anger, even though she still has it inside. Why don't I test my mistress further? <laughs> She's living on the edge. Yeah, this is kind of, uh, she is going to get into serious trouble if she carries on like this. All right, okay. Anyway, so we'll see what happens with this Kali. <laughs> So Kali got up later in the day. Videhika said, said to her, What the hell, Kali? What is it, madam? You're getting up later in the day? What's up with you, girl? Nothing, madam. Nothing's up, you bad girl. And you get up later in the day, angry and upset. She blurted out angry words. Then Kali thought, My mistress actually has anger in her and just doesn't show it. It's not that she has no anger. It's just because my work is well organized that she doesn't show her anger, even though she still has it inside. Why don't I test my mistress further? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I, what, what would you say? Would you tell Kali, please stop Kali, you are living dangerously? Yeah, relax, hold back, don't test that mistress any further. <laughs> she, <laughs> you might get into trouble. Anyway, oh. Anyway, so let's see what happens. So Kali got up even later in the day. Videka said to her, What the hell, Kali? What is it, madam? You're get up, getting up even later in the day. What's up with your girl? Nothing, madam. Nothing's up, you bad girl. But you get up even later in the day. Angry and upset, she grabbed a rolling pin and hit Kali on the head, cracking it open. Oh, bad idea. So this is what happens when you test things too far. So be careful with all this testing. Yeah, don't don't try anything similar. <laughs> then Kali, with blood pouring from her cracked skull, denounced her mistress to the neighbors. See, ladies, what the sweet one did. See what the even-tempered one did. See what the calm one did. How on earth can she grab a rolling pin and hit her only maid on the head, cracking it open just for getting up late? Then, after some time, the housewife, housewife Videka got a bad reputation. The housewife Videka is fierce, ill-tempered, and not calm at all. So that is um, the story of the housewife Videka. Mm. <laughs> so, uh, so, say. Yeah, I will leave that to you, Venerable. Uh, you can. <laughs> it's not advisable to go around testing people. I would not, not, it's not really a smart move, but, uh, you know, it's still kind of interesting. Yeah. But uh, it shows you that, uh, you know, it, it's, this is really the point, of course, here. It's not really Karl. The point is Videhika. We are all like Videhika. So we are supposed to be even-tempered, even when things get difficult, yeah? So it is Videhika we should compare us, ourselves to. We should not compare ourselves to Kali. We shouldn't go around testing, te testing people left, right, and center. <laughs> it's not a good idea testing too many people. You end up with serious trouble if you do that. Uh, so uh, do you ever get tested, Venerable? Do you have, do you have tests? Do you have tests in your life? Uh, you, have, no, you, you don't have to reply if you don't want to reply. I'm just, I'm just being naughty. <laughs> OK, so let's go on. In the same way, a mendicant may be the sweetest of the sweet, the most even-tempered of even-tempered, the calmest of the calm, so long as they don't encounter any disagreeable criticism. But it is when they encounter disagreeable criticism that you will know whether they are really sweet, even-tempered, and calm. 
Yeah, it's true, isn't it? Uh, what does it mean to be really even-tempered? If everyone is always nice to you, it's kind of e easy to be even-tempered. Uh, but it's when someone criticizes you, you kind of get to find out. Uh, so maybe you, should, you, should, you shouldn't be so kind to me. That's the whole point. You should criticize me more. Yeah, you should kind of test me out a little bit, see what happens. Uh, maybe I, I don't, yeah. Ooh. You don't want to crack skull. You don't want to crack skull? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have much faith in me, do you? <laughs> That's kind of <laughs> okay. <laughs> fair, fair enough. I can see your point. You want, you want to be, you don't want to test. You want to kind of take it. Yeah. Okay. So let's see. So, uh, but it is when they encounter disagreeable. Yeah, that is when you find out whether they really are sweet, even tempered, and calm. I don't say that a mendicant is easy to admonish if they make themselves easy to admonish only for the sake of robes, arms, food, dwellings, and medicines, and supplies for the sick. Why is that? Because uh, when they don't get robes, arms, food, lodgings, and, and medicines, and supplies for the sick, then they are no longer easy to admonish. Yeah, so if you are nice always for exterior reasons, ulterior motives, uh, then it is not really you're not really nice, you're not really sweet, you're not really even tempered and calm. Yeah? So it is always the real reason why you should have these qualities because they are implanted in you. They are part of you. You have become this kind of person. That is the whole point here. But when a mendicant is easy to admonish purely because they honor, respect, revere, worship, and venerate the teaching, then I say that they are easy to admonish. So mendicants, you should train yourself. We will be easier to admonish purely because we honor, revere, respect, worship, and venerate the teaching. That is how you should train. It's really nice, isn't it? Beautiful. You've honored the Dhamma. You have contemplated the Dhamma. You understand that admonishment and someone pointing out or correcting you is often for your own well-being. And so you actually... You welcome admonishment yeah? by those people who have your best interest at heart. You welcome that admonishment. Thank you. Thank you for pointing out the treasure. And why? Because you know that this is what the... If you want to practice the Dhamma, it's a positive thing. It takes you in the right direction. So you honor the Dhamma. You worship the Dhamma. If you really have faith in the Dhamma, this is what you do. And you open yourself to correction. Open yourself up to correction in this way. So uh, this is how one should train, yeah? Of course, this here is to monastics. And of course, for monastics, this is even more important because the monastic path, you are committed even more to the Dhamma. But uh, obviously, it is helpful for everyone, whether you are a layperson or a monastic. Yeah? So, uh, hmm. Okay, let's carry on now. Mendicants, there are these five ways in which others might criticize you. This speech may be timely or untimely, true or false, gentle or harsh, beneficial or harmful, from a heart of love or from secret hate. Yeah, so you can be criticized for all of these five reasons. And uh, so the first thing, of course, to note here is that if you want to criticize others, you should try to use the five positive qualities here yeah you should do it at timely it should be true it should be gentle it should be beneficial and it should be from coming from loving kindness coming from compassion coming from friendliness when you do it this is a very good um kind of list right there to check whether you're whether you're criticizing in the right way one of the strange things about uh, human beings is that the defilements are often very compelling yeah, when there's a defilement in your mind, you're getting angry with somebody, it's very compelling. It drives the mind very powerfully, that anger. And the anger will say, now you must act. That's what anger says to you. It drives you forward. Uh, and so it's very important not to buy into the compelling nature of the defilements of the mind. Desire says, act now. Anger says, act now. The emotions that we have very often blind us to the truth. We take the emotions to be reality when the emotions are not really reality. Emotions are just our reaction to the world outside of us. So we have to be very careful with taking the emotions as being too real. They're not really real. And so hold back when those emotions are very strong. 
Yeah, so timely criticism is really important. Uh, when is the other person open for this? Uh, what is the right time for doing these things? Uh, very often we criticize at the wrong time. The wrong time is because you're angry. The right time is when the other person is open to be criticized. Uh, true or false? Well, that's kind of an obvious one. Yeah, that's not too hard to understand. Uh, gentle or harsh? Uh, criticize gently. Listen, friend, I. There's something we need to talk about. Yeah, this is really important to me. Uh, will you please listen? Yeah, let's sit down on the seat. Here's a cup of tea. Huh? Yeah, are you okay? Is this a good time for you to talk? Yeah, let's have a chat. Uh, this is really important. Will you please hear me out? Uh, uh, I'm hoping to. This will be beneficial for both of us, or something like that. Uh, yeah, and then you start off by the sandwich technique. You know, I really value our friendship, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, uh, and because I value your friendship, I want to point this thing out. And some, you know, this is how you do things in a gentle and kind way. Yeah? And then, for the benefit of both, uh, and then from a heart of uh, metta, a heart of compassion and kindness, uh, not from coming from hate inside. Uh, this is a nice little short list for you uh, to uh, keep in mind. Uh, and, um, yeah. So there are these five ways in which others, other people, of course, then we are not in charge, so we don't know what's going to happen if other people criticize us. So then it's more, we have to deal with whatever happens, really. When others criticize you, they may do so in any of these ways. If that happens, you should train like this. Again, our minds will be unaffected. We will blurt out no bad words. We will remain full of compassion with a heart of love, of metta, and no secret hate. We will meditate, we will dwell, we will... I think meditate here is not the right word. The Pali is viharati. It just means we will exist or be in a state of spreading a heart of love to that person. And with them as a basis, we will meditate spreading a heart full of love to everyone in the world. Abundant expansive, limitless, free of enmity and ill will. That is how you should train. This is really interesting because this is very different from how you normally think about loving-kindness meditation. Yeah? So first of all, we have noted the five ways. People may sometimes criticize you in, in really bad ways. They may be untruthful. They may be lying. Yeah, that's kind of the worst thing. They may be lying and angry to you at the same time and be really insensitive to your needs. Maybe the wrong time. Maybe everything in one go. Uh, and that happens sometimes. And regardless of what other people say or how they do it, uh, still, this is how you should react. Uh, yeah? So still, we react with being unaffected. Still, you don't actually say anything bad in return. Uh, Still, you are full of compassion, yeah, despite all of these things. And then comes the interesting thing, yeah, that you start when you meditate, yeah, or when you want to have a loving kindness for the whole world, you start with that person. That is the foundation, that is the basis. And that's kind of interesting. How, what, what does that mean? This is contrary to what we normally learn in meditation practice. If you learn how to do metta in the classical Theravadan way of metta practice, what is the classical Theravadan way? Where is classical Theravada found? It is found in the Visuddhimagga. Visuddhimagga is the classical Theravada meditation manual. If you want to know what Theravada Buddhism is, the best place to go is actually the Visuddhimagga. Yeah? Not the suttas. The suttas are broader. They can go across all the traditions. But the Visuddhimagga is kind of Theravada in a nutshell. And what it says there is that when you meditate loving kindness, you start with yourself. That's kind of what it says in there. Yeah, and that's kind of uh, interesting. Why does it say that? Uh, here it says you start with a person who is difficult. Uh, so who is right? <laughs> is the Suddhimagga right or are the suttas right? Uh, well, I would say usually the suttas are really kind of the ideal. But of course, there are ways of squaring the circle here because uh, sometimes the suttas maybe have a very high... Um, it may be very high what they're trying to teach us, yeah, very difficult to do. And so the Visuddhimagga may give us a more preliminary way of doing the meditation practice. You start with yourself because it's more easy. But the ideal is this. So how can we achieve this ideal? And the way to achieve this ideal is to recognize, first of all, is that you start off. You don't have any enemies in the world. 
Yeah, when you start out with this, you already have a sense of friendliness and compassion <coughs> and care for everyone. You don't have any enemies. That is the starting point. So your mind is already kind of pure when this happens. Yeah, as Buddhists, we shouldn't have any enemies, right? We should be friendly to everyone. It doesn't matter who they are. And if other people want to be our enemies, that's their problem. But we won't have any enemies in the world. There's no need to have enemies. We can have compassion and understanding to everyone. <coughs> And because that is our starting point, then when someone is very difficult, then they become the potential first enemy. So we want to quell that first enemy. We want to get rid of that problem before we can have real compassion and kindness for the whole world. And that is why we deal with that person first. Because the assumption here is that we have no enemies. We have no one we don't like. We don't have anger towards anyone. But here, potentially, anger could arise. So we deal with that person. We have loving kindness for them. We go back to the basic ideas that people who are bad, who do bad things, they are like a sick person. Yeah? If you go back to the first beginning of this retreat, it seems like a long time already, doesn't it? It seems like a long time ago. It's like time has gone so fast and still it seems like a long time ago. I never understand how to, how to make that kind of fit together. Time goes fast and yet it seems like a long time ago. It's weird. Many things have happened in between. So this is how then you make the meditation possible, by dealing with all the ill will and then the final person, uh, the most recent person who is causing your problem, you deal with that person. You get that hindrance out of the way. And when that hindrance is out, out of the way, then the mind is ready to kind of radiate compassion and kindness to the whole world, uh, because the hindrance has been overcome, uh, the thing that was standing uh, in the way. Uh, that's why it has them as the basis. Yeah? We will meditate spreading the heart full of love to everyone in the world. Let's look at what, the, um, what it says in the actual sutta, because I reckon that is important. So let's see, Majin Manikai 21. I tiny little text again. So let's see if we can expand that a little bit. Mm. So let's see if we can find this. Uh, Whoa, too much expanded here. Huh? Oh, there we go, that's better here. Huh? Um, so here we go. Yeah. Then as a basis, yeah, so here we, this is, this is the one. Yeah, so Tad Aramana. Aramana is basis. We have it down here. See this word down here? That is basis. So we said them as a basis. That's exactly what it means. Them as a foundation, them as a starting point almost, yeah? You then have um, a metta to the whole world, um, to everyone in the world, the sabbavantang lokang, the entire world, everyone. Um, I suppose, yeah, if you say the whole world, it means everyone, so it kind of is implied. Uh, and uh, so you have this to everyone in the world. Uh. So, um, yes. Um, Okay, so let's, let's do some meditation there because we've been going on for quite a while now. Huh? Okay, any uh, comments or questions or uh, anything else? Mm. <coughs> Please. Uh, again, uh, there's a question. In being a Buddhist, uh, you're not supposed to harm or kill Sometimes uh, you may be uh, a soldier or by choice or by, by no choice, I think we be conscripted. Yeah. And then <coughs> in the worst case, I think you'll be sent to the front line and uh, this enemy in front. Yeah. Uh, so you're in a dairy bar where you send many thousand bullets. Should I uh, he be uh, sent back to him that he well and uh, Happy or the same bullet, the he be reborn in the hell or the heaven. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's Denima. So what's, yeah. what's the Buddhist way? <laughs> what is the Buddhist way? Yeah. Yeah, don't send the bullet. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think there's, you know, the first thing to do, of course, is to avoid getting you in the situation to the best of your ability, not to get in that situation. Uh, uh, if you're going to be in the army, be the doctor in the army, be, be something like that. Yeah. Try to avoid the frontline position. Uh, 
But if you really do end up at the front line, I would say uh, aim, don't aim at the soldier, aim above their heads, you know. This is what, uh, this is what Ajahn Shah apparently said to one of the monks. One of the monks was conscript conscripted to the army in Thailand. This was during the Second World, not the Second World, during the Vietnam War. Uh, and there was uh, clashes between Thailand and Vietnam at that time, apparently. Uh, and one of the monks was conscripted. And the monk said to Ajahn Shah, what should I do? Uh, Ajahn Shah said, you should go. Uh, <laughs> And he said, well, what if they ask me to shoot the enemy? He said, aim over the head. That's what he said, apparently. And so you go, but you don't actually kill. Yeah? And this way you can actually combine the, uh, the idea of uh, compassion and uh, not killing at the same time. Uh, the problem for most soldiers these days is that you actually get trained to become a killer. Uh, yeah? They manipulate you psychologically so that you become a better killing machine. Uh, and this is kind of the scary thing about the modern military. It used to be the case, apparently, only about 100 years ago or so, most of the soldiers they sent to war, 80%, they never shot at the enemy because they you know, just, just didn't do it. It was too difficult. It's actually very hard to kill another person. It takes, it takes a lot of uh, overcoming, a lot of psychological barriers to be able to do that. Uh, so what they do now in the military, one of the most important things, apparently, is to kind of break you down psychologically to the point uh, where you are able to kill. They kind of create a killing machine out of people. Uh, and so that why it, that's why it's so useful not to go into the get into the military in the first place because they it's actually very damaging yeah the kind of training you get sometimes unless you are the doctor or you are some you know some kind of service person and actually it is uh, is uh, you know obviously okay yeah. yeah. Ah, to Ajahn. Mm -hmm. um, this advice to Venerable Paguna, it's because he is a monastic. Lah. It, are we to apply, especially this paragraph whereby okay. if someone strikes those nuns with fists, stones, rods, and swords in your presence? Yeah. Because I find it. Yeah. It's not so practical, I don't think. You'll end yeah. up being a doormat yeah. for someone to just. You yeah. know, and, and then, like earth ladies, then we have a lot of sexual harassment <clears> in the <throat> office. So, how do you balance it? Yeah. And then, yeah. And then if, yeah. if we were to turn a blind eye, not really turn a blind eye, I mean, if. Yeah, it's sort of turning a blind eye, then you won't have people like Gandhi, Nelson Mandela fighting for Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, I, I don't don't be a doormat. That's not, not the right approach, you know. Being a doormat is always a bad idea. Turning a blind eye is also often the, the wrong idea. So this is a very high level of practice. Uh, and uh, the reality is that most people will get upset in those kind of situations. You will get angry at. Huh? And uh, even if you do get angry sometimes, okay, it's probably, it's not a very bad kind of anger because you're getting angry in self-defense in a way and you are, sometimes you are actually protecting yourself. And so one of the questions that sometimes arises in life is, well, is it okay to, you know, to hit someone in self-defense? Is it okay to even kill someone in self-defense? And uh, to say it's okay is going too far, but it's actually not, it's not a terrible crime, yeah, because you're doing it for reasons that are you're not motivated by uh, by you know by greed or by kind of pure hatred you're motivated in large part of looking after your family or, or whatever it might be here so it's not terrible but even in that case it's ideal not to get too angry with the person yeah because if the more angry you are the person if, if it is more to do with compassion and looking after your family then it's not so bad but it is because you it's very easy to start hating the person because they are attacking your family yeah? And that is where the problem starts to arise because then you are driven by defilements again. Uh, and then killing can become problematic or, you know, even hitting back can become problematic. Yeah. So, uh, so the idea here is to approximate, to come as close as you can to this. Yeah? Remember that uh, other people, when they do things, even if it is towards your family, it is not because they are evil as such. There is no evil in Buddhism. Everything is just conditioning here. Yeah? Evil assumes that there's some inherent thing in you which makes you an evil person. No one is inherently evil. Uh, just they are conditioned in a certain way. Uh, and they have been conditioned in an unfortunate way. Maybe they grew up in a bad home, you know. They had bad parents, they had bad teachers, they had all these bad things. And so they turn out to be a bad person. Of course they turn out to be a bad person. Uh, how could they not? Uh, 
Yeah, they had to be turned the bad person. And then you kind of start to feel compassion for them. You start to understand that actually they're probably hurting inside. They don't know what they're doing. They're blind, they're stupid, they're hurting. They have all kinds of difficulties in life. And then they do something, and then they do bad things to others. Of course they do bad things to others. And so you start to understand the broader picture of things. And so it means that you take precautions and you do what you have to do, but you do it in a, with a bit more wisdom than you otherwise would. That's the thing. So this is not about being a doormat. It's about being wise in your reactions, uh, understanding how to react to other people. Uh, so if they treat you badly and you are cool, usually you can make better decisions than if you get angry uh, because you can look at the situation more kind of more <clears throat> carefully. Okay, what should I do now? Yeah? And then you actually come up with some good strategy instead of coming up with the immediate thing, which is kind of pull out the gun and shoot the person. Yeah, That's not the best idea. I don't know if you have a gun. You probably haven't got one. <laughs> So, uh, but you come up with a better strategy very often. It's amazing. If you are really cool, you can often come up with good strategies. Yeah. You can say it to the person. I remember a beautiful story I heard in Perth. This was a lady. She's uh, from Thailand originally. And uh, she uh, uh, came, she had just been shopping. So, being to, gone to a big supermarket or whatever. And she went to load all the shopping into a car. Yeah. But when she came to the car, there were all these kids. I think they were Aboriginal kids in Australia. And they were playing around the car. And some were lying under a car. And they were messing around and kind of creating trouble for her, right? And so she didn't know what to do. She couldn't just drive off. She would, she would, she would have killed some of these kids, yeah? And it would have caused a lot of problems. And maybe they wouldn't want to leave anyway. Maybe they would have become violent. Who knows what would have happened? Uh, and so she uh, said to all the kids, she said to them, uh, they're kids, right? Uh, Let's go and take, have a burger at McDonald's. Uh, McDonald's was just next by. So she took all the kids into McDonald's, uh, gave them all the burger and some, some, uh, some French fries or whatever. Yeah. And then they were all really happy. Yeah. They all smiled and they were all kind of grateful to her because of being so kind or whatever. And she solved the problem. So she, she solved her own problem and she was generous at the same time. And this is kind of the mind that is trained to think in, in wise ways, that remains cool, doesn't get angry. It comes up with new solutions, uh, with new possibilities. Yeah? And she came up with that on the spot. It's like an intuition on the spot. And this is what I have to do. Yeah? And she did it. Uh, and it's such a beautiful, wonderful example. Yeah? It's just really, really powerful. Uh, and very often these possibilities actually exist in the world. Uh, there are alternative ways of doing things. Uh, but sometimes there is not. And if there really isn't, uh, then uh, if the worst comes to worst, uh, you shoot the person out of compassion. Uh, yeah, I don't know if that will hopefully never happen in, in anyone's life here. But even if, you if, even if it comes to that point uh, and you do it out of compassion, knowing it is wrong, knowing it is not ideal, but you have to look after your family, I would say it is not terribly bad karma. It's a little bit bad karma because shooting someone is never a good idea, but it's not terribly bad. You're not coming from ill will or anger. You're doing it as a very last resort in a very difficult situation. Yeah, yeah I think Ajahn, the, the, the thing that we always have this dilemma or hard to wrap around is that we equate being kind to being nice. Oh. So if I'm not nice, then I'm not kind or something like that. So, so we always think that we have to be always nice and be a doormat and just be passive. Right. Yeah. But actually yeah. being kind yeah. doesn't mean you have to always be, be, a, be a doormat, be a, be a passive exactly. uh, kind be of... Passive, precisely. Yeah. Pa exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's true. I think that's a very often misunderstanding in Buddhist circles, actually. You're just supposed to be passive and not do anything, which is not really right. Yeah. 